It has all the twists and turns of an espionage thriller, missing scientists, secret documents, questionable security, tight-lipped police, and a government trying to hide information from Parliament about the whole fiasco. What could possibly be in those documents? Hello and welcome to the Unpublished TV. I'm Ed Hand. We're coming to you from a remote location and practicing physical distancing to enhance safety. The husband and wife team of researchers were escorted out of Winnipeg's National Virology Lab in the summer of 2019. Now, all the Public Health Agency of Canada will say about that is it was an administrative issue and they won't elaborate on that. This is one of the most secure facilities in Canada. Parliament's Committee on Canada-China Relations has been demanding those documents regarding the removal of the scientists, but the public health agency won't release them, citing national security issues. Now, the Liberals have gone as far as filing a lawsuit against the Speaker to keep those documents hidden. So our unpublished vote question asked you, should the federal government respect the wishes of Parliament and provide the documents on those Chinese scientists? Well, overwhelmingly, our viewers and listeners feel yes, 97.9% felt that. However you're watching and listening to our show, whether through our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, or our podcast channels, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and more, I'd like to remind you, you can still cast your vote on this topic at unpublished.vote, and then email your MP to tell them why. Now, joining us to discuss this complex issue is Mel Cap, Distinguished Fellow, Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto, as well as former Clerk of the Privy Council of Canada. And Elliot Tepper is a Senior Fellow at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. And gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And, and Mel, this seems to be boiling down to the House of Commons versus the courts. In your view, which do you feel is supreme? Yeah, no, I, I, there's no doubt that Parliament is supreme. That isn't the question. The question is, what is the will of Parliament and how do you measure it? Uh, just a bit of precision. It isn't that the government is suing uh, the Speaker. It's rather they're exercising the legitimate uh, regime that was created in statute, created by Parliament, which gave the Attorney General the right to go to court to protect information. So this is respecting the will of Parliament, and I think it's really important to to emphasize that. The other thing is, I mean, you're you're going to come back at me and say yes, but there was this motion. Uh, well, the question is, do you have the legislation that's been passed by both houses of Parliament, given royal assent? and that is the rule of law, or do you have the House of Commons motion? Which one do you respect? I know the answer to that. It's the rule of law. Elliot, you know, for a government to not disclose information to Parliament, what concerns could it have about those documents? We have the uh, kind of rock in a hard place. We have a situation where we are absolutely entitled as, as the public of Canada through our elected representatives to receive the knowledge uh, that's available. On the other hand, the government has an absolute duty to keep us safe. And now these two are running into each other in this case, and there does not seem to be a mechanism to resolve this uh, in the, in the par existing parliamentary procedure. There's no doubt at all we're entitled to it, but on the other hand, uh, they are entitled to keep their sources safe so that they can keep us safe. It's a real clash here of conflicting absolutes. Mel, we talked about that motion um, about a parliamentary law clerk to review and redact what could compromise national security in those documents. Why is that not an option? Do you know the name of the par parliamentary law clerk? Do you know uh, the parliamentary no, law clerk? And do you know what he knows? Do you know where he's been? Do you know what he's done? He has a duty to parliament. He doesn't, he has never seen a top secret document in his life. Okay. How is he going to decide whether something is secret or not? That's why we created this regime in the statute in the Canada Evidence Act, which says, and it's under the title, by the way, part of, I mean, I totally agree with what Elliot uh, Tepper just said, uh, but, but the caption for this section is called International Relations, National Defense, and National Security. And I don't know which of these the particular information falls under, but it says that a proceeding, it defines a proceeding, and it says a proceeding is a, a proceeding by a body with the jurisdiction to compel information. Parliament and the parliamentary committee is a body with the jurisdiction to compel information. And it says that if there is sensitive 
or potentially injurious information, then the official has to go to the attorney general and say, what do you think? What should I do? And the attorney general says that if it's in, and this is what parliament tells him to do. It says, if it is injurious to international relations, national defense, or national security, you issue a certificate and protect it. And that's what the regime is set up to do. Injurious, could that be a subjective term? No, this is all no. very relative. I mean, if you're looking for bright lines, there are none. Uh, and, and that's why we use the courts to determine this. I mean, I trust the attorney general to make that judgment. But frankly, sometimes we're going to get an attorney general that we don't have confidence in. I like David Lametti, and I've never met him, but I think he's probably capable. Uh, but who knows? Um, you know, if Ed Hand became the attorney general, I'd want to be able to go to the courts and just check. And that's what the regime does. And that's why the, the attorney general has gone to the courts and said, here's the information I'm protecting. You have to view it in confidential and private. You can't have a public hearing uh, about it. Uh, or disclose it to the public before you make a judgment, but the courts will then decide. Elliot, CSIS was the one concerned about the two scientists' activities and security. What what does that tell you? All that we can say publicly is that CSIS has a concern, and they expressed it to the RCMP. There was apparently actionable intelligence about the nature of this particular um, situation regarding a lab and two of its scientists, the uh, nature of that concern is out of our view. We should point out that CSIS in 2018 started to raise publicly, which is unusual for CSIS, the fact that China is now emerging as a security concern for us. Uh, others have done this in the past, increasingly around the globe actually, we can come to this perhaps more later today, China is coming into focus in a way that makes us suspect, you know, it isn't what we thought a decade ago. So the alarm bells have been ringing. CSIS has done its job. We are not able to go beyond that in terms of what's visibly public. Mel, uh, Ian Stewart's refusing to release those documents because right. he feels they could be obviously injurious to national security. Uh, is, is that his decision to make? Uh, no, it's not. He um, is obliged to go to the attorney general, and it's the attorney general who makes the judgment on that, which then gets either validated or overturned by okay. the courts. But but just to, uh, you yeah. mentioned, Ed, uh, earlier, and so did Elliot, uh, the prospect of disclosing sources and methods. And that's what this is about. It's, it's to protect those sources and methods. And again, I agree totally with Elliot's point that we're, we're faced with a tension here about my right to safety and my right to access to information. And we've got a, we've got a regime which balances that. But let's stick with this notion of my right to safety. Um, the government is going to protect that uh, to by protecting sources and methods. So consider two possibilities, and uh, these are totally hypothetical. I know nothing about the information that's being protected. So, uh, you know, I, so therefore I can speak candidly. Uh, but <laughs> think about this. If this was information that had been provided by one of our Five Eyes uh, intelligence partners, exactly. uh, that the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand had information about this particular scientist that they had intercepted from um, communication, say, um, and then they provide it to us and say, you better worry about this, or let me tell you, we're worried about this. Again, hypothetical, but who knows? You want to protect that information. You don't want to disclose that the NSA or the Australian Security Service uh, has come across this information. Consider an alternative one, and here I'll defer to Elliot, who knows the China, China policy uh, situation better than I, but imagine if there was somebody at the Wuhan uh, Virology Lab who, um, who knew something about these two scientists in Canada and disclosed to CSIS or, uh, or some other uh, intelligence agency that these people were spying on us. Don't you want to protect that person? I mean, if they, that gets out, they're dead. I mean, we want to be able to provide protection uh, to our sources for a good reason so that we'll have other sources that come forward. Uh, it, how much do you think, Mel, the, uh, you, you mentioned the five eyes countries uh, are keeping an eye on this situation you know, in terms of sharing more information? 
For sure they are. If I mean, this is what worries me. Um, it, it almost doesn't matter what the nature of the information is. But if Parliament were to be successful before the courts, then our colleagues in the Five Eyes would be looking very carefully at what that information was and whether it was something that they would have protected. Because then they're going to become very closed down. Uh, when I was high commissioner in the United Kingdom uh, right after 9-11. And we were in Afghanistan, they were in Afghanistan, but they went to Iraq and we didn't. They stopped sharing with us about Iraq. Now, you know, was it crucial? No, we didn't have our Canadian forces at risk in, uh, in Iraq. But um, did it mean that we got, knew less about what was going on in Iraq? Absolutely. You don't want to lose uh, the information that's coming from our uh, colleagues and allies. And, you know, I guess possibly if they get concerned, they could start uh, holding back on information as well, right? For, for sure. And, uh, you know, I mean, imagine what we would do if, if information that we had intercepted or got from a human source, uh, human intelligence, uh, and we provided it to the United States, and they disclosed it to the Congressional Committee on Intelligence or the Senate Committee on Intelligence, and then it got leaked. What are the chances we're going to give them information ever again? Not, not for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, Elliot, this is just the latest incident in the, in the Canada-China relationship, which, you know, we've discussed it several times, has been skidding down downhill. Where do you see this heading now? This is day 952 of the captivity of our the two Michaels, clearly on spurious grounds, all, all relating to Meng Wanzhou, the COO of Huawei, a company designated as a champion company by the, by the People's Republic. The only way we can see this going in terms of, um, to answer your question, where it's going, we are going to, I think, be part of leading and to be joining the international consensus that China is not what we thought it was, that China has come into focus, that China is uh, a concern not only to us, uh, but to the global community. I've watched very carefully when Joe Biden made his international tour. Uh, he went to, as you know, to the G7, but also to Brussels, then to NATO. All of that was specifically and pointedly to say America is, is back. There's no longer an exploitable vacuum for countries like, and he, spec he specified this, and interestingly, in the communiques out of the G7 and out of NATO as well, specifying China. So China has, uh, NATO, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and it's now saying it's concerned with China as well. So the idea that China, that we saw a decade ago as China potential trade partner has become the People's Republic of China. Now we're talking about the Communist Party of China under Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping and his wolf warrior diplomacy and our two Michaels are paying a cost. But China is paying at least a reputational cost so where we go is to help guide the international consensus, joining, therefore, Joe Biden and others uh, with what to do about China, pay close and different attention than we did in the past. Do you think China really cares about its reputation? I think it does in the sense that uh, China is laying claim to being the foremost country in the world by 2050. And they're saying... In, in Davos and elsewhere, we're not trying to upset the status quo, we're trying to become the status quo. Uh, but they are long, long past the peaceable rise mantra of earlier regimes. Uh, Deng Xiaoping said, you know, hide your strength and bide your time. Xi Jinping is, has no intention of doing that. The, uh, remember, we, we're talking about in our immediate past right now, Hong Kong and uh, Xinjiang, and I'm very concerned about what's going to happen in Taiwan and the taking over the South China Sea and the disputes they have with the East China Sea. There's actually been a flare up of violence with India. So an ongoing long, I'm glad to go into that one. That's kind of my field. So, but the point is, is that China is now saying that we are not going to bide our time and hide our strength. This is our time. There's been a vacuum in global politics. We're planning to fill it. 2008 was part of that. The whole world was economically flat. They had a lot of money. So the Belt and Road Initiative was basically an effort to say all roads in the future are going to lead to Beijing. 
I would just add, Ed, the, um, I agree with everything you've said, uh, but, but uh, the, I would just add the notion that in answer to your question, uh, the Chinese uh, take the long view, as Elliot pointed out, um, and they look back at centuries of what they've characterized as humiliation. And so do they care about their reputation? Yes. Do they uh, care about it in the long run? Yes. And are they prepared to uh, suffer some uh, humiliation in the short run as a result? Not much. No, no. I, I, I'm wondering, you know, in terms of the Mel, in terms of the uh, the liberals and, and what they're trying to do here with uh, with the uh, with the speaker, um, is this? Do you see this as a political move, or or are the other parties trying to make this into a political move? Um, I think the other parties are trying to make it into a political move, and indeed, uh, it it's been. Um, uh, the Conservatives, the NDP, and to some extent the Greens, although they're a little preoccupied right now, uh, <laughs> that have uh, made this um, an issue. And uh, the government has basically tried to deflect it and defer it. Uh, and, and one of the things that they have done, and we can dispute whether this is the right strategy or, or tactic or not, they've tried to play a low key approach to China until uh, they, we can resolve the issue of the two Michaels. And until Kovrig and Spavor are released, I think there's a danger in escalating anything related to China. Yeah, I could, I can see that. Well, you know, the other side, we, you know, China is still concerned about Meng Wanzhou in, in Vancouver, right? Very much so, and uh, and you know, we're caught between that. That's Elliot referred yeah. to a rock and a hard place. That's our rock and hard place uh, because. You know, we do believe in the rule of law, as I've suggested, and we have a treaty with the United States on extradition. I do not understand why it's taken two years for that uh, to be resolved, but um, it's still in the courts. Uh, but, you know, we can uh, essentially ignore the our obligations to the United States, or uh, we can uh, submerge our um, our attempts to remove release uh, the two Michaels, and I think we're dealing with that, but we're dealing with it at a low key level, and it unfortunately may have to be like that. Yeah, I can see that. You like you hear you don't like, want to do any negotiating in the public. Elliot, do, do we know where these uh, these two scientists are now? It seems it's uh, it's uh, difficult to try and track them down. Well, one of the interesting things to me is that. We talked about this a week and a half ago. We talked about it earlier. This whole issue has just dropped from the news like a stone. Now, is mm. that because, you know, news moves on or is there a security blanket over anything? So nothing comes out. Last we heard, um, a couple of weeks ago now, apparently they have moved to a home that they already owned in China. And they, uh, so apparently they're in China. And uh, that's also seen as somehow suspicious I'd like to, uh, on their behalf, point out that the former boss, their own boss in that lab has said this, and I, and I share some of this. Uh, he said, look, their lives have been just turned upside down. Remember, this is a woman, this is a Canadian scientist, in, in, because she was acting on our behalf, who helped solve the Ebola crisis, came out. She's got, we have lost a very productive scholar, both of them actually, uh, they, are, they are real stars in their field. They say their lives have been turned upside down. They thought it was an administrative problem uh, and to get into the weeds on this quickly, but you know, they, they've been, they did transfer material, but they thought it was covered under protocol. No, it wasn't. And initially it was transfer of intellectual property rather than security concerns that was uh, flagged. I, I, I personally linked those a lot, but the fact that uh, they are not charged at the same time, their lives have been turned upside down, and at the same time, their own co-worker is saying, we didn't see anything wrong, and we're, we're experienced. He's now a professor at Laval uh, doing epidemiology. Mm -hmm. So have we lost a real asset in terms of research? Research is inherently international and global. It's better that way. Boy, but with China, we have now learned, uh, we have now learned perhaps the original assumptions about how collaboration works should not be followed in the case of this particular emergent 
China today. Mel, I, I am wondering, do you, do you see, uh, you know, down the road for Canada, China, that uh, the two sides will sort of be pulling apart, not uh, trading with each other, or, or, you know, obviously a lot less uh, interaction than we've had? Um, no. I think uh, we have to remember, first of all, that the Communist Party of China is, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is watching uh, this and watching what's happened uh, to these two scientists and to uh, the controversy in parliament. Uh, this is not playing out in secret. It's all public. That's what we do, and that, which is a good thing. But therefore, yeah. we are having an effect on uh, that relationship. Um, and so I, but I, when it gets back to it, I don't see any uh, lurching action one way or the other on the part of Canada, uh, because we'll want to protect the long run. I mean, we, we don't uh, look over the horizon as well as the Chinese, perhaps, but we want the long run relationship to be uh, positive. And we don't want to go through, and you pointed this out, Ed, that we don't want to go through a, uh, a public shouting match where uh, we're doing the negotiations in public. That's not going to resolve this at all. Uh, Elliot, uh, what's the next step for, for Canada in, in this situation from your perspective? What do you think? Well, I'm not sure which situation you're referring to. If it's in, in terms of China, to these, yeah. If it's generally in China, that's one thing. If it's in regard to these two individuals, it's another. And mm -hmm. I want to, at this point, uh, interrupt the conversation to say, whatever is happening, we cannot let this whole issue balloon into an anti-China, yellow peril, return to the past kind of thing. We have a security situation with two individuals. It is being dealt with. It will one way or another be resolved. The broader question of what to do about China is a global issue. Uh, everybody's asking that very same question. I think, uh, thank you, Mel, for pointing out that the, from the Chinese point of view, they have now entered a period of national rejuvenation, no matter who their leader is, national rejuvenation after a couple centuries of temporary blip, uh, humiliation, but in their 2000 year history, they are now returning to their rightful place, shrugging off humiliation. So that, that's guiding them. Uh, they, have to, they, have to, they now have the onus of dealing with the rest of the world that's increasingly saying, if that's how you want to behave in asserting your return, we're not sure we want to go along. We have Pew data on that. Not only in Canada has the reputation gone down, but there's now suspicion uh, around the world in terms of China. And as I pointed out, the institutions, the global institutions that deal with global world affairs in various ways also are very concerned now about what to do about this particular incarnation of the leadership you know, of the leadership of China. And, and you know, we look at Australia right now, mm -hmm. very heated uh, disagreement with, with China. And, you know, again, that's gonna, that's gonna reflect on their reputation. We also should remind ourselves, Mel may want to weigh in on this, China is not an emerging power. China is a power. They're already the number one or number two or number three trading partner of just about everybody everywhere. Uh, Canada, as it turns out, is an exception. We discovered in, actually the very, a very small part of our overall trade patterns, 4% or something. For Australia, they're number one, and yet Australia stood up to them in a way that caused them to be treated in a fashion that the globe was now saying, China, really? That's how you want to behave? You want to deal with your situation with a trading partner like that and the way you're doing? They slap them around uh, mightily. They will use vaccine diplomacy in an era when we need vaccine equity. Uh, so what kind of what kind of leadership does, does China wish to now uh, demonstrate to the world? And right now, what they're demonstrating to the world is, is not something that encourages a, an optimistic short-term future. Yeah, can I just add uh, sure. the the question of you know uh, is this going to lead to a trade uh, dispute? Uh, uh, recognize that we have. Uh, so much embodied uh, products in what we buy. It's not just the imports from China. I, I, Ed, I warned you, I might have to leave this because I was taking delivery of a stove. Yeah. Uh, the range was uh, as a Samsung built in Korea, uh, nor, uh, nor South Korea, but um, the, uh, the burners were made in Italy and the plates on top were made in China. 
Um, we're not, it's not just the Chinese uh, pr imports that we're talking about. It's the entire supply chains around the world, which are totally integrated. And the great thing about globalization has been that we have improved our ability to source low cost at the, to the advantage of Canadian consumers, products that get embodied in all kinds of things from all over the world. Indeed. Mel, I, I'm wondering when we, when we, you know, obviously this is kind of a unique situation with the uh, the government trying to set up to sue the speaker, as it's been described. H how do you see it playing out in the end? What what do you predict? Um, I, I, you know. Yogi Berra said it best, uh, yeah. predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. Uh, look, I, I uh, don't know uh, how this will play out. My guess is the court will hear this. It will be taken um, out of the politics for the moment. Uh, the court, I hope, uh, will come to a judgment which is con consistent with those principles of national security and international relations. And then, um, and that may be releasing it or not releasing it. Uh, but then um, uh, that doesn't mean that the opposition is going to let it uh, slide. And, uh, and so this will be a, an issue that comes back. Uh, but I think it's it's lying low now, as Elliot pointed out, it'll come back um, when it goes to when it's in the courts. Uh, there's a prospect of appeal from the uh, federal court to the court of federal court of appeal and then to the Supreme Court. There's a again, part of the regime that's built in here. Uh, and so uh, this could be disputed for quite a while. And if the election is sometime in the next six months, um, and again, if I knew, I wouldn't tell you, but since I don't know, <laughs> let me tell you, uh, that uh, it would likely um, uh, be part of that uh, election campaign and something that'll come back. I mean, it, it, you know, is there anything they can do about it? I mean, you know, go back to uh, the Harper government and their protection of secrecy. I mean, they respected the law on this stuff and they claim national secrecy on a whole range of things. And remember when Dick Fadden first floated, he was the uh, head of CSIS, first floated the issue of China on the CBC. Um, that became a, a controversy mm -hmm. and he was supported by uh, the Harper, by the prime minister Harper and the Harper government. So I don't think that there's something fundamentally different about the, at least the two major parties. Gentlemen, a uh, great discussion on a very interesting and complex issue. I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you. To talk my, about my favorite philosopher, too. So, Yogi right. <laughs> I want to thank our guest today on Unpublished TV, Mel Kapp, the Distinguished Fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto, as well as the former Clerk of the Privy Council of Canada. And Elliot Tepper is a Senior Fellow at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. And I want to thank you for watching. Unpublished TV. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.